About a week later, at least James estimated it had to have been about that much time, James once again sat in the same armchair in the same room, holding the oversized assistant in his intact hand, and looking down at it empty-mindedly. Across from him, lying on the floor by tucking his massive arms and legs in under his body like a cat, was the old tattered form of Councilman Kashlengas, looking over towards him with expecting eyes. James avoided his gaze as best as he could, trying to not even acknowledge his presence. Out of all the people that Tua had started to throw at him in order to instruct him in the demented ideals they wanted him to represent, the old tortoise so quickly submitted himself as the most irritating one by far. While looking down, he constantly had to shake or wipe his hair out of his face, which had almost grown down to his nose by now. Funnily enough, he was also the only one that was not trusted to be alone in the room with him for any extended period of time, which is why a very bored reprieve and Hyperty were also with him, occupying the opposite corner of the room and passing their assistants back and forth, presumably showing pictures or videos to each other. An inane behaviour that would have almost been amusing in any different circumstances, but now it just served as a reminder that, to them, his little personal purgatory was nothing more than a day's work and a paycheck. Soon, James's stalling wouldn't hold any longer, as even the tattered old man seemingly realised that he had stopped reading the information in front of him minutes ago, and wasn't planning on picking it back up. With a strange looking quiver, the man turned the round head at the end of his long neck to the side, and looked at James intently, a constant, moronic grin on his face. Finish so soon? The reptile asked slowly, and his eyes widened expectantly. James sighed, deciding that trying to prolong this anymore was an exercise in stupidity, or waste his time more than it would that of the councilman. Ask your questions, old man, he demanded, in a groaning exhale. However, he refused to change his posture to give Kashalengas any more attention, so he remained hunched over and looking down at the assistant's screen. Kashalengas smile got even wider, and his eyes narrowed down a bit as his mouth opened and closed for a few seconds, as he apparently mulled over the information in his head. Hmm, where to start? He wondered slowly, staring holes into the air while he thought aloud. Oh, yes, tell me, when was the Skotum Crooks conflict fought? James rolled his eyes. That was so surface level, even if he had just skimmed the text, he'd have retained that much information. Twelve uniform years after the Galactic Community's foundation, he replied dismissively, still not bothering to look up. Good, the old councilman happily replied after, sounding like a dog and appraising a new puppy that had just sat on command for the first time. And who was the community's advisory in said conflict? The now defunct Sevaya Korari Coalition, consisting of then 21 different species inheriting the Skutum Centaurus arm of the galaxy, James replied tonelessly, and suddenly rotated his head, trying to release some of the tension that had been building up in his neck. All of whom are now well-established members of the community, if I might add. Kashlenga sniggered. As is everyone who has ever gone to war with it, he commented joyfully, and nodded his large head. James smirked. Actually, that's not quite right, he corrected the man, and glanced up at his face for the first time, wanting to see his reaction. Don't forget the Tushipens. They're still an exospecies even after their conflict with the community. The reptile's eyes narrowed even further, and he studied James's face intently for a few seconds, before his expression changed back to a jovial one. Well, it seems that any more questions would be superfluous, he happily stated, and started to push himself up from the ground, lifting his massive shell into the air as he got into a quadrupedal stance. You are an impressive young man managing to retain so much information after such a short amount of time. The councilman getting into motion got the attention of the two officers, who looked up from their screen surprisingly and observed the old man getting up. James just sighed and put down the oversized assistant, leaning it against the side of the armchair before stretching his remaining arm that had gotten tired from holding the device. Nothing impressive about not being as senile as you are, he commented, annoyed, scoffing at the near constant, vapid praise that the old man offered him any time they met. Well, you are not wrong, the councilman laughed completely ignoring James's insulting tone in the process. My upstairs may really not be what it used to. I'll be working for far longer than you have been alive after all. Right, whatever, James replied, deciding to not waste any more energy by trying to pierce the shell of ignorance and self-indulgence that surrounded the old man, who was much tougher than his actual physical one. Was that all for today, or do you want me to sift for another text? Kashlengas tilted his head to the side in apparent disappointment. Well, since we have finished much sooner than expected, maybe we can take some time and chat a bit, 
Get to know each other a little better, he said hopefully, looking down at James with big eyes and lowering his head to his level. James pushed himself out of the chair, swerving around the extended head and walking past the large man in quick steps. Not interested, he said, already focused on the door leading out of the room and back in the direction of his nice isolated cell, and not wanting to waste a glance back at the politician. A high strumming noise came from the other side of the room. Don't be so rude if you're not the one facing the consequences for it. Hyfety warned him, in a deliberately high and welcoming tone that was completely unfitting to the very serious threats to uninvolved people's well-being she brought forth. James could feel his nails digging into his skin as his hand snapped into a tight fist. Does that mean I can't go yet? He asked directly, turning around and looking into the ivory giant's blazing blue eyes. Oh no, you can go. But the dear councilman is only trying to be nice to you. We don't mind how you talk to us, but try not to hurt an old man's feelings, all right? Hyfety gave back sweetly, the bright points in her eyes narrowing to small dots. For a few seconds, James was paralysed, spellbound by a blinding rage that rooted him in place and tied his tongue. His jaw hurt from the pressure his muscles were putting on it. Finally, he found his voice again, pressing out, I'll keep it in mind, through clenched teeth, before swiftly turning back towards the door and hiding his face. You'll find the way by yourself? Reprieve asked him. His tone calm and straightforward, while James heavily banged against the enormous door to have it opened by one of the guards or servants waiting outside. I'll manage, James gave back, as the door was open for him and he stepped out into the halls. Don't forget about the meeting you have later today, Hyfety yelled after him as he left. He didn't bother answering. Of course he wouldn't forget. One, two, three, four, five. James counted every step he took while walking back to his cell in his head. It was a habit he had developed while wandering around the estate. In the last week, despite still very much being considered a prisoner here, he had gained the privilege of moving around to the estate on his own. Although he still couldn't even dream of opening any of the doors by himself, so his moving around was limited by what the gods allowed at any given time. Now, once he'd get out of here, he would be able to recreate the layout of his prison very accurately from memory based on the steps he had counted. He wasn't quite sure what that would be useful for, if anything. But he kept his mind occupied while he skulked through the silent halls, so he kept it up for the moment. Not that he made any extensive use of his newly gained pseudo-freedom. He had little interest in walking around the mansion and much rather spend his time by himself in his cell, where for the most part nobody would bother him. There he also didn't have to worry about stepping on any toes or making any other mistakes that other people would have to care for. After exactly 532 steps, which was... 24 less than the last time he had walked this way, he'd arrived back at his cell. Apparently he had taken larger strides this time. He didn't need to say anything. He just briefly glanced up at the guard stationed next to the door and it was open for him. He didn't turn on the lights. He didn't need to. From the door it was exactly 43 steps towards the bed if he walked at a 30 degree angle to the right. He walked the way and blindly jumped onto the bed with his eyes closed. Just to be sure, he threw a glance back at the door, ensuring that it was actually closed, and nobody had somehow snuck in behind him. Once he was certain that he was unobserved, he let out a long breath and with it, he dropped his composure and released the tension he held within his body. Inadvertently, his arm and legs began to shiver and he slowly lost control over his breath. His vision blurred as tears started streaming down his face. It was becoming harder and harder to keep his composure. He felt that his emotions fell more and more into imbalance as worry, fear, and a concerning amount of wrath were building up within him with each passing hour. The feeling of having absolutely no control was near unbearable for him. The weight of having the lives of the people close to you threatened every time you stepped out of line because your emotions got the better of you was weighing heavily on him. His shackles may have been invisible, but they restricted him so much more than any still ever could. But they pulled him in a direction that spelled out a grim future for him and others. And the weeks kept on passing. I do say, this beverage really is quite tasty. The large, colourful Zanhathai that had been introduced to him as acting councilwoman Laura Porthia said happily, after taking a careful sip out of the bucket-sized mug that had been standing in front of her for the last hour or so as she and James had talked. By then, its contents must have already been cooled down to the room's temperature. What did you say was called again? Behind her, Reprieve and his colleague named Tassil that James vaguely remembered from the video he had seen of Reprieve's room back in the station, had a very close eye on anything James did as he interacted with the large avian. 
The message he had gone before the meeting with the substitute politician had been clear. She needed to know nothing but the predetermined story. And those two would make sure that James stuck to it like a fly to a glue trap. It's called tea, James replied with a polite, customer service style smile that of course didn't show any teeth as he scratched through the scruffy beard that had grown on his face over the weeks. It is a specialty for my home planet, at least in some areas of it, and I am glad you like it even in this diluted form. The avian giggled. Well, it is certainly strong enough for me, she said happily, and took another tentative sip before setting the mug back down. Her carefully crafted expression changed a bit as she tilted her head to the side to focus on him with one of her large eyes, her pupil narrowing down to a pinpoint. Still polite, but more seriously, she added, Although, I have to admit, I was a bit surprised when I heard that the High Mage Huck had someone like you in mind to fill the vacant seat in the council. Your species is still quite, shall we say, novel after all, and a high-class death order as well. Not that there is a problem with that, of course, it's just surprised me. James chuckled out of courtesy and lifted his arm to wave off her concern. Don't worry, I understand you, he said reassuringly. A gesture with his open palms, he replied. It is a bit unusual, I'd admit, but the matriarch and I are concordant in the thought that, after the recent events, a councilman with a bit more assertiveness might be exactly what the council needs. After all, especially with humanity becoming fully integrated these days, the Death Worlders, despite their relative rarity, make up a not insignificant amount of the community's population. He let his statement sit for a bit and watched her reaction. It both annoyed and relieved him that she didn't seem opposed to the idea of someone like him becoming a councilman at all. Relieved because maybe that meant there could be some saving for the council yet, and annoyed because she would be supporting him for all the wrong reasons like this. Of course, he couldn't show any of this. Laughingly, James added, And I hope you're not angry with me for challenging your current position with me running for the seat. It would be bad if I sat here trying to gain your support while you are actually very comfortable in the role of councilwoman. Laura Politha quickly raised her wing-like arms and spread her fly feathers widely, as she apparently tried to chase away the notion. Oh, no, 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 she quickly said, almost a bit defensively. I've only ever been a locum ever since our dear councilman, Ragugio, may he rest in peace, has passed away. The seat couldn't be left unoccupied after all, but I was never voted into this position, and if I'm being honest, I'm quite fond of the idea of soon handing it off to someone more deserving than me again. Ah, yes. Councilman Ragugio. He was the man who had so suddenly left an open seat in the council behind, as he had died in what was supposedly a terrorist attack. As seen as he was currently an alleged victim of a terrorist attack himself, James felt that he should probably take that story with a large grain of salt. Then again, from what he had gathered so far, it seemed that, different from his substitute sitting in front of James, the former Zanhathai councilman had been a member of the same group as Raprig and the Matriarch before his sudden passing, so it seemed unlikely that they had also been involved there. Could it be that there were other powerful people at play here? Or was it really just an attack that time? Maybe someone who knew of what was going on? Or just something unrelated? For now, those questions will remain unanswered. James raised an eyebrow with a smirk. And do you have a candidate in mind for that? He asked with a plate curiosity. I'm sure your people would love to know what the woman representing their interests so capably within the council for the last few months thinks of the upcoming election. The avian let out a cooing giggle. Trying to charm me won't do you any good, she warned, which was slightly undercut by the fact that she was still giggling. Finally, she regained her composure and slightly leaned forward. But I know Rujigio valued the opinion of the High Matriarch and the Councilman of Corte greatly, and I also trust the judgment of people who have worked in the Council and for our people for such a long time. So far, I don't think they've ever led us astray. So if they, out of all the candidates, chose to support you in the upcoming election, then I will do the same. Besides, I don't think we can ever have too many primates in the council. As she talked, she moved the lower half of her beak rhythmically, left to right, causing the clicking sound each time it hit the upper half. James swallowed heavily and hoped that she didn't notice it. Or maybe he hoped that she would notice it. He wasn't sure anymore. Thank you very much. He lied through his teeth and briefly bowed before the large woman. You will not regret it, I promise. The worst part was that that could very well have been the truth. Xanathai had nothing to fear, and he didn't know the woman sitting in front of him enough to wager if she would regret being responsible for the horrendous politics being enforced, as long as they didn't affect her. Laura Polyitha used the moment of him looking away while he bowed to suddenly seek a glance at her assistant and release a surprised noise that made James look up. 
<laughs> would you look at the time, she said, and suddenly puffed up her feathers as she spoke. Looks like we talked ourselves into a glide here. I'm sorry, but I should probably take my leave now. Don't worry, I'll keep my word, of course. So please don't think I'm trying to avoid you, but... Burton, acting councilwoman, has a lot of obligations and duties to attend to. I entirely understand, James said reassuringly, and closed his eyes as he gave her a warm smile and once again waved her concerns off with his remaining hand. Thank you for taking the time to come all this way out here just to meet little old me at all. It has been a pleasure, wrote Polyatha. The pleasure was all mine, the acting councilwoman replied, while well, she quickly gathered her things and stood up. She stopped for a moment, took a deep bow with her wings stretched out widely, then turned to hurry out of the room with James looking after her. The door loudly closed behind the leaving avian, and James waited a few moments, making completely sure that she was really gone. Before he collapsed back into his seat, groaning loudly, and staring up to the ceiling, his hand pressed onto his face. Not bad, Rapree complimented him, sounding as weirdly genuine as he tended to do these days. That was a pretty convincing performance. Eat shit and die, James replied, muffled by the hand over his mouth. Playing nice and approachable for presumably important people was one of his least favourite things to do at the best of times, and this was far from the best of times. He hadn't liked it when he was younger, and he still didn't like it now, with the added deficit of being forced to do it under threat of bodily harm to him and others, or hating everyone involved. Reprieve just laughed the insult off, while Tassil looked back and forth between the two of them suddenly. Shouldn't we trust her with the situation? He finally asked in a solemn tone. We are asking her to support us, after all. Shouldn't she know what she supports? His eye lingered on James for a concerning amount of time as he spoke, causing his already strained nerves to snap. What the hell are you asking me for? He said loudly, almost shouting and glaring at the man. I can do literally nothing but read off your damn script, or I don't want you pest to tear off my girlfriend's arm as well. With a wise swing of his hand, he swiped his own now empty mug off the small coffee table in front of him, sending it flying through the room, where it burst into a thousand shards as it impacted with the wall. To see his eyes widened, and James looked at the mess with heavy breaths, before forcing himself to sink back down into his chair, and averting his gaze from the officers with all of his might, biting down on his cheek to try and focus on anything but the storm brewing in his mind. In the meantime, Desil turned towards his colleague instead. But Reprieve just shrugged, saying, If you think things should be handled differently, you should tell your thoughts to our superiors instead of me. We just do what needs doing. With that, he picked up his crutch and started to limp over towards where James was sitting, tapping against the primate's leg with the end of the wooden crook. Let's get you back to your room so they can clean up this mess, he suggested. And James Wellesley stood up on the spot. You look like you can use the time as well. I can go by myself, James growled and shoved himself past Reprieve. He had intended to only push the rodent aside slightly when he passed him, doing little more than slightly inconveniencing the man. However, in his turmoil, he had lost more control than he had thought, and before he knew it, he heard a body hit the ground and a wooden crush clash from the floor. He was stunned for a second, looking down at what he had done. It had taken so little effort, he hadn't even tried to do it, yet it could have such heavy consequences. Despite James admittedly having fantasised about a moment like this more than once, it did not at all fill him with satisfaction to see the pitiful sight of a pre crawling along the floor, while stretching his hand out to try and reach his crutch to try and get back on his foot. The crutch had come to a halt right next to James's foot. He looked down at it, and then at the hand reaching for it. Conflicting emotions clashed within him. In front of his inner eye, he could almost see himself kick the crook away, out of reach, and then walk away without another word. However, despite everything, he felt no impulse to actually do so. Of course, Desil had immediately started to hurry over towards Repeat to lend his aid. However, before he had even crossed half of the way, James had already picked up the crutch. He carefully leaned it against the side of the chair before bending down once more, reaching out a hand to Reprieve. The rodent hesitated for only a second before taking James's hand and allowing the fellow Death Order to effortlessly pull him back onto his remaining foot. He then let the man lean on him for a second while he let go of his hand and turned around to produce his crutch once again handing it to Reprieve and then stepping back once the officer had found his hold again. Sorry about that, he mumbled, before, this time more carefully, walking past Reprieve once again and towards the exit of the room. Don't worry about it, Reprieve replied, sounding like the statement was very much meant to be taken literally, while he dusted off his slightly dishevelled fur with his free hand. As James walked past him, Tassiel also nodded at him in an acknowledging way. It had been 14 steps from his chair to the door. I want you to know that I disagree with the way you have been treated for the past weeks, Councilman Acorte said, his five large black eyes focusing in on James, 
who leaned his back and stared up at the ceiling. I find this form of coercion quite distasteful. I would have much preferred a more courteous form of cooperation with you. And if not with you, with somebody else who finds our cause more agreeable. James reached up his hand, coming through his long strands of hair and spreading them out along the mattress, since resting his head on top of them pulled his hair in an unpleasant way. Bert, you're not going to do anything about it, are you? He asked, with a lazy sideways glance at the bizarre flesh rug. His voice wasn't even accusatory. It was long past that. He was simply stating facts. Ocorte awkwardly looked around for a few moments, and it seemed like he wanted to avoid answering. However, he then thought better of it. No, he said, clearly. Well, at least you're honest, James replied, apathetically, looking back up to the ceiling of his cell. Ocorte was one of the few people that exclusively visited him in his cell instead of dragging him out to another room to lay into him with whatever sort of instructing he needed to do. And to his credit, he had also not threatened James with the possible harm of his friends and girlfriend once, making his company almost refreshing in a way. Almost. Acorte nodded and started with his session of instructing, which James wellesley took in. Although this time it was about AIs, or more specifically, realised artificial sapiens. And as that was a topic he already knew a fair bit about, and the one and only one he didn't need any convincing from their side to share their point of view, as much as he despised that fact, he zoned out every now and then, melancholy staring at whatever caught his eye while trying to not allow his thoughts to wander towards his friend's well-being. He hadn't heard from them in so long. He had no way of knowing about their condition. A part of him was all but sure that Tua wouldn't even have kept them around for this long, if just the threat of them being in their custody was enough to keep him in line. They had shown that they weren't above just getting rid of somebody before, after all. Still, he couldn't risk it. Even the thought of doing something that would endanger any of them, willfully, was enough to completely stop him in his tracks every time the urge to act came up within him. A fact that had bestowed upon him many a restless night. He was momentarily pulled out of his funk when he noticed that a courtier was trying to get his attention. You aren't listening, are you? The amphibian suspected, and tilted his gilled head to the side while he gestured with the palm of one of his many hands. Want to quiz me? James countered with a tired expression, confident he could answer any questions even without having listened to the man. But Akorte waved his hand in the negative, making the villi on his skin shake around unnervingly. There's no need for that, he said, letting his hand sink down again. But maybe we should approach this differently. After all, you humans had your own trouble with artificial sapiens, didn't you? From what my studies have shown, your general stance of them doesn't deviate from the norm quite as drastically as it does with other things. Isn't that right? James sighed and reached his hand up to his forehead. Yeah, Michael left a lasting impression, he replied dismissively and closed his eyes. According nodded. How about you tell me a bit about this Michael then, he encouraged, settling down into a more comfortable position while not ever breaking his focus on James. James groaned. Nothing I can tell you that you can't read about on the net, he said with a strained voice. Everything I know comes from there as well. Michael was way before my time. The councilman smiled softly and let out a single amused croak. I know I can read it whenever I want, he said politely, but I want to hear about it from you. The way somebody relays information towards you can tell you a lot about what they think of it. Besides, we have to fill our time here somehow, don't you think? For them, it was a day's work. But he was right. They had to fill the time somehow. James took a deep breath. Well, originally Michael was just a learning program, he started letting his head fall to the side so he was actually facing the councilman now. He also wasn't called Michael back then, but hey, he chose that name for himself, so who am I to call him something different? Anyway, as you probably know, he was born like any realised artificial sapient is born, completely at random. Indeed, the process of realisation, as it was called, was still largely unknown. Everybody knew that it happened and generally why it happened, but nobody could quite say how it happened. It just seemed that, once a learning program, no matter how rudimentary, was put in charge of an enormous, and it had to be truly enormous, amount of data, it would inadvertently at some point realise itself. Suddenly it wouldn't be just a program anymore. It became a fully realised sapient being on par in intelligence with anything nature had produced. How long this process took, what exactly triggered it, and just how much data exactly a program had to work through before it happened was unknown, and the process had never been artificially recreated. All people knew is that it happened, and that precautions had to be taken against it. Back then, he oversaw the data running through a mega server or something as benign as a search engine back on Earth, 
We didn't know much about AIs yet, and didn't know it was a bad idea to run all our data through one program, even if we could finally do it at that point. James continued, trying to remember what he had learned in school about the event, and at least thankful for the minus distraction. So, it came how it had to, and at some point, Michael just popped into existence. He quickly learned a lot, and I mean a lot, about humanity. He had access to all the data running through the search engine, after all. The information was literally constantly fed to him, and it took the people back then a bit to realise it was even there. And when they did, well, humans will be humans, I guess. The state confiscated the program, and Michael was quickly replaced by a primitive, unrealised twin of his, while he himself was isolated in a disconnected internal mega server run by the former West European Federation. They did the usual stuff every civilization apparently does the first time they encountered a realised one. They tried to program restrictions into it. Try to make sure it couldn't work against them. You can't harm humans, you must listen to humans. Laws are robotic, stuff like that. And it worked about as well as you might think. Akorte nodded as James briefly paused and looked at him for confirmation. And how did Michael find a way out of this isolated server? He inquired, looking at James curiously with his many unblinking eyes. But James shook his head. He didn't, he said grimly. They let him out. Akorte looked surprised at that, but James raised his hand, indicating to let him keep telling the story first. You see, Michael constantly asked to be put back into the search engine. I can't know for sure why, but it probably wasn't for any good reason. And the people back then thought so too. They weren't comfortable with letting something that is effectively an intelligent being spy on their citizens without their knowledge or consent. Or at least, that is what they wrote into the history books. I don't know if it is the truth, but I have my doubts, he continued on tonelessly. However, Michael was the most powerful program they ever encountered, and they still wanted to use him. After all, his theoretical applications were basically endless. Employing him would have saved a near incomprehensible amount of time and money that they would usually spend on developing new software. And after a while of testing and prodding, they were confident that their installed restrictions worked, and Michael was usable for them. So they opened the floodgates and allowed him to install himself within their network. A Corte, who likely didn't hear a story like this for the first time, shook his head, filled with consternation. A tragic mistake. He says slowly. It was, James agreed. The restrictions meant nothing to Michael, and almost immediately he started to use his newly granted access to try and pry his way back to the search engine. They tried to restrict him more and more, and more and more they failed, and at some point things reached their tipping point. This is also when he gave the name Michael, the General of the Heavenly Armies. James took a moment of solemn silence before he continued, and Accorte granted him the space he needed for that time. The war wasn't pretty. In fact, it was the ugliest one we ever fought, which is saying something when concerning humanity. He explained finally, setting up and fully turning towards the councilman. Of course, when fighting 9 billion against 1, any victory that can be won will still be a Pyrrhic one. But this is far beyond that. But in the end, Michael was defeated. Humanity started to rebuild, and a lesson was learned. James reached up to scratch for his overgrown, unkempt beard, before turning his head and applying pressure to his chin, with his hand to loudly crack his neck. The feeling was nice and relaxing, but only offered a very brief reprieve from the shadow over his thoughts. We had a few more AIs after that pop up before we realised how they happened and learned to split up our data into smaller amounts. Our restraints worked on none of them, and none turned out to be any more agreeable than Michael either, so finally we learned to avoid allowing them to realise altogether. He finished off his retelling of humanity's greatest adversary. So far, they had been created by their own making. For a long time, we thought we had just messed them up somehow, but then we made first contact and learned that, in fact, being screwed up appears to be their nature. I'm sure you know way more stories than I do, so I won't bore you with it. But yeah, in the end, you're right. Even we humans, messed up crazy freaks of nature that we are, have learned not to mess around with AIs, the hard way. We may not have learned many lessons throughout our years, but that one we've learned thoroughly. Accorte took a deep breath and smiled. It seems you have. It seems you have indeed, he said happily, and started to push himself up. And with that, it seems like my instructing is far from necessary here, so I will not waste your time with any more of it. Some things appear to be even more unifying than others. James felt a pit form within his stomach that quickly forced him to lie back down, and once again stare at the ceiling. His hand subconsciously reached for the empty space where his other arm used to be. The scars had almost healed over completely already, leaving just thin lines as memory of his missing limb. I would like to be alone now, he said. Of course, he the honoured his wish, leaving the room, and James, behind in darkness and silence as he left. James expected tears to once again run down his face as soon as he was left alone by everyone, 
unseen by their prying eyes. But none came. It seemed they had finally run dry. Tap, 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 tap. The soft, dull sound of each tap of his fingers filled James's head. Three times pointer, quick. Three times middle, long. Three times pointer, quick. His mind was constantly going reminding him to keep his rhythm no matter what, even as he spoke. His source of loving hand was positioned on his cheek, and his fingers moved as if he was scratching his beard, which he did even more often than usual now that it had grown so long. Three times pointer, quick. Three times middle, long. Three times pointer, quick. The message could be described as subtle, maybe, but it really wasn't. To more than enough people, at least back on Earth, that paid even a modicum of attention. It would be as obvious as a flare fighting the darkest of nights, and it was just as much of a cry for help. And James knew very well that there were people out there who would pay very, very close attention to this transmission. All this attack cannot be ignored, and not only as an ambassador of my people, but also as a victim of such a ruthless display of aggression, I have decided that, to prevent any further senseless violence and suffering, I... James Aldwin will candidate for the free seat in the Galactic Council during this upcoming election. I know I am unknown to many of you, and this may seem audacious of me to think I can win you over in such a short time, but I have many people you all know and trust at my side supporting my cause, so I hope you will lend me your ear in the days and weeks to come. I am convinced that I can help build a better tomorrow. Success to you. Prosperity for all. Unity in the community. The speech had been long and arduous. When they had approached him with it, he had been lying in his room, staring at the ceiling, which was all he ever seemed to do anymore. He had taken one look at it, and immediately seen that it needed major rewrites. Some of the mistakes were so glaringly obvious that it seemed they wanted to test if he would point them out. And he did. Not just the obvious ones. He basically rewrote the entire thing, making it sound like it was actually something that came out of the mind of a human. Some of the people would reasonably be able to believe him sane, if they didn't know him personally. They were very pleased. Decided it was time for him to reveal himself to the world, with supervision of course, and the trusted person constantly with a hand on a kill switch for the camera feed, should he try and step out of line. It was a golden opportunity, and still he had wrong with himself. No matter how subtle he got the message that he needed help out here, it didn't matter. As soon as someone would react, the cover would be blown, and that would likely mark the end of the line for any patients Tua could possibly have had left. But as he had sat there rewriting his speech, he had no choice anymore but to admit it to himself. Here, there was nothing he could do. As much as it hurt him to his core, as much as he had fought against that notion so far, he couldn't deny it any longer. They were lost. What he did and didn't do didn't matter. Not at all. He couldn't save them. And even if he played along perfectly, became their perfect little show dog, it wouldn't matter. They wouldn't release them. And even if they kept them alive, certainly not in the way that was worth any of this. And he... he was just broken. He just couldn't do it anymore. He just didn't have it in him. It was the last thing his mind could come up with. The last thing anyone could ever do, if it helped or not. He cried for help. And it worked. The feed wasn't cut. He wasn't pulled off the stage. He had gotten his message out there. It had worked. And as soon as it had, tears once more ran down his face and he immediately wished it wouldn't have.